Hello, welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at Jenny's Supper Club here in Harlem, New York. Tonight, Blessing the Band Stage is multi Grammy nominated drummer, composer, and educator Bobby Sanabria. And he has a lot to celebrate this year. One, he's been nominated twice for Best Latin Jazz Album for his latest release, Multiverse, which is a big band CD in which he pays an homage to the greats ranging from Don Ellis to Duke Ellington to Wayne Shorter, as well as he's one of the vocal musicians that really, really protested and got the Best Latin Jazz category reinstated in the Grammys. Tonight we're going to sit down and talk about this CD. We're going to sit down and talk about his origins growing up in the Boogie Down Bronx, how he was exposed to jazz music, and what made him and what called him to the drums and percussion. I want to congratulate you personally, man, for a couple of things. First of all, the Grammy nods for Multiverse. Also, what you have done within the last year to reinstate the Latin Jazz Best Album category for the Grammys. You've had a heck of a year. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it was a tough fight. You know, it was a collective effort. Myself and uh, my three fellow plaintiffs, uh, Mark Levine, Ben Lapidus, and uh, Gene Marlowe. It got to the point where we we had we sued the Grammys because they just wouldn't listen, and uh, also all the great help that uh, well-known celebrity musicians like Bonnie Raitt and Carlos Santana, and Ruben Blades, Larry Harlow, and people on the West Coast like John Santos, Sandy Cressman, Wayne Wallace, Bobby Matos, so many people too numerous to mention. Eddie Palmieri also helped out in terms of being very outspoken. Uh, but people ask me why did you get why did you get to the point of uh, 
a lawsuit, but we had to because, we, we, first of all, we had a moral obligation, and second of all, there was no basis to take away the category, as there was no basis to take away the other category. So we hope to inspire the other category, uh, members of the other categories to unite and fight as, as, uh, as we did. And also I have to thank uh, so many people that signed the, the petitions, uh, over 28,000 people, um, organizations like the National Hispanic Media Coalition, the National Hispanic Foundation for the Arts, the National Institute for Latino Policy, Presente.org, um, all these great organizations, Local 1199 here in New York City, uh, Local 802, the Musicians Union, Local 47 in Los Angeles. All these organizations uh, came to our aid in terms of uh, uh, being outspoken as well, issuing public uh, statements that this was, uh, this was wrong. And uh, also Reverend Jesse Jackson, Dr. Cornell West. Uh, I mean, there's so many people to thank. I know I'm leaving out somebody, but, uh, you know, basically it was a very, very much a collective, collective effort. It just shows the power of unity. Also, you know, we, we still have a way to go, like you said, you know, blues and gospel, which is also part of the American music culture, as well as the, the folklore and the diaspora they still are omitted from the Grammys. Yeah, I mean, in, 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 if you listen to the, what the Grammy, the, the, the Board of Trustees at the Grammys say, well, no, those categories still exist, but they're lumped together with other categories. And when you do that, uh, you, you marginalize forms of music that, he, that are marginalized already even more so. They, they tend to disappear. There's an, uh, a category called Americana, which lumps together everything from blues to gospel, etc., uh, R&B artists, um, folk artists. I mean, it's ridiculous. So these categories need to be reinstated be, to draw light upon these neglected forms of American music that are just as valid as anything that, that Jay-Z does or Rihanna. They have nothing against them, but the mission of the Grammys is not only to celebrate uh, million selling records, but also records that are popular, but also forms of music that most Americans would never get a chance to hear unless the Grammys shed light on them. And that was the, the why we were so passionate in our fight to reinstate Latin jazz. Um, and, uh, you know, we won. I just feel bad that, that, that uh, there's still like 29, 30 categories that still need to be reinstated for there to be parity. In, in the Grammys, so I'll still be conti continue to be outspoken, and uh, because uh, the um, one of the things that was great about this movement to get the Latin jazz category back was that all of us that spoke out against this, we all were in unity, saying that all the other categories have to be brought uh, back. Also, we were in solidarity over that. So, if any who is who's ever watching this, if you're in one of those affected categories. You can contact me or any of my brethren that, that were part of this uh, were part of this movement uh, uh, for advice. And uh, but the basic advice is: uh, let your voices be heard. Speak up.
this latest CD is getting lots and lots of press. In fact, you cover the great, great masters from Wayne Shorter, and then you do a tribute yeah, yeah. to Duke Ellington. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were inspired to do this by a book, right? Well, it's a series of writings by the great Mexican author Octavio Paz that my uh, lady Elena Martinez turned me on to. And he talks about that the greatest civilizations that have ever existed have always been combinations of different ethnic groups f fusing together into what he calls a multiverse. So, I mean, after reading that, I've always found a, tried to find something in a, uh, in a short way to explain what we do. And, uh, and also watching Neil deGrasse Tyson on TV, who a lot of people don't know, his mom's Puerto Rican, you know, so uh, he's from the Bronx like me, and he always talks about the multiverse, which is a, a, a new theory in, in uh, astrophysics, about instead of being universes, there's these multiverses. So that best describes what we are collectively as a people, the black and Hispanic experience. And especially New York born Puerto Ricans like myself. Uh, but basically, you know, in New York, if you're from New York and somebody asks you, where are you from or what, 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 what describes the culture that you, that you represent, I says, well, now I, I don't even say I'm a New Yorkerian anymore. I just say, well, I'm from the multiverse, man. And that ain't. <laughs> It, that opens up a, a dialogue immediately because people don't have really don't know, use that term, and uh, but it really describes what we all do uh, in terms of the orchestra that, that that my big band, my small group Cuarteto H, my Nane Ascension, and all of us, you, everybody, you know, here we're all part of the multiverse. So when somebody asks you, hey man, what are you? And I go, well, I'm just part of the, the multiverse, but man. Deal with it. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about how you put together, because you've recorded a big band project before, and you've several, several, right. yeah, several. How did you put this together? Well, I've had this big band since 1998, 99, and the first album that we did in in, two, in 2000, uh, New York City, uh, what was it called, the uh, uh, Afro Cuban Dream Live and Enclave, was recorded live at Birdland. That was nominated for Grammy, and then Big Band Urban Folk Tales in 2007 was nominated for Grammy. Uh, the big band CDs I've put out with the students at the Manhattan School of Music, those have been nominated for Grammys. So it's very interesting, all the big band CDs I've put out have always been nominated for Grammys. Very interesting about that, you know, that, that little factoid. Mm -hmm. The stick out track is the composition you dedicated to Duke Ellington and that really, really kind of floored me because it's like not too many people today are really paying homage to the great masters like Duke Ellington. Right, well that was composed by Michael Philip Mossman. It's like a potpourri of different Duke Ellington uh, pieces or pieces associated with him like Musta Mooch, uh, I've Got It Bad and That Ain't Good, uh, you know, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, sophisticated ladies, uh, sophisticated lady rather. I mean, it's all a beautiful, uh, what we call in Spanish, mosaic or mosaic. And Mike did an incredible job. He's really a truly masterful composer. We, we, our association goes way back in the Mario Baza Afro-Cuban Jazz Orchestra, Mario Baza being the uh, father of the genre. And Mike was a trumpet player, one of the trumpet players. I'm, I was the drummer, and one day he, um, he wound up sitting next to me on a plane, and he started asking me, hey man, can you, can, can you talk to me a little bit about clave? How do I arrange in clave? And so forget it. That conversation has never stopped, but it's brought forth all this incredible music that Mike's been doing for the last few years. Really masterful composer, and that's one of the Grammy nominations we got for that Duke Ellington suite. So uh, um, we'll find out on February 10th if we win it for that and for the best Latin jazz album. So we're really grateful for that, and I'm very proud of Mike, all the work he's done. <laughs>
One of the things that I really admire about you, Bobby, is first of all, you understand the rudiments of not only your Puerto Rican roots, but you also understand the African connection as well as how the music came to not only New York, but also East Harlem. Right. right. Tell me the importance of how Latin music found its way to New York, East Harlem, and then found its way through the rest of the United States. Well, in terms of finding its way to the United States in 1930, this great orchestra from Cuba comes here to New York City to perform Don Aspia Zuna in Savannah Casino Orchestra. They record a song, a Cuban folk tune called The Peanut Vendor, which is in Spanish, El Manicero. And in 1931, it becomes like a million selling hitter across the country. Through the, through, and it was fortuitous, they recorded a small film short that's about 12 minutes long that was shown in movie theaters across the country. But it was interesting because that people for the first time in the United States saw a multiracial band. This Don Aspiasu Havana Casino Orchestra. They had a trumpet player, Umberto El Chino Lara, who was a Chinese Cuban, part black, part Chinese. He was Chinese mulatto. Antonio Machin, the great vocalist they had, was very, very dark skinned, but he had a very handsome man, angular features. Uh, Don Aspiazu was my color skin, for lack of a better term, white, he was the pianist. So it was a pretty amazing for uh, white America to see that. But it, funny with the way racial mores were back then. If you were black and you spoke Spanish or French, people didn't look at you and say, oh, you were black. They said, oh, he's Haitian, or he's Cuban, or he's Puerto Rican. So unfortunately, that caused some friction between the African American community and the Latino community because they said, hey, you know, these people are getting over because simply because they speak another language. But uh, it just shows you how the ignorance that racism uh, promotes. Because, for example, Mongo Santa Maria, who I worked for, for started my career with, is black Cuban. But because of that, he uh, it prevented him from almost losing his leg because when he was with the Perez Prado Orchestra, they were down in Texas, the bus driver falls asleep, they were on tour, the bus driver falls asleep, they go over a ravine, Mongo's ankle is broken. When they're in the hospital, doctor goes, uh, oh, this guy, what's wrong with him, nurse? And she goes, oh, he's got a broken leg, a broken ankle. This is a black guy, he used the N-word and said, oh, we'll just amputate it. And one of the trumpet players who was Puerto Rican, overheard what he, they said. He says, no, 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 he's not black, he's Cuban. So the doctor said, you're Cuban? He goes, speak Spanish for me. And the guy, Mongo spoke Spanish, and because of that, they go, oh, I'm sorry, okay. So they put a cast on his on his ankle. Can you imagine that? He would have lost his, uh, his leg if he hadn't spoken Spanish. So that's the way, unfortunately, things were back then. Um, it's just ridiculous. I mean, the things that Obviously, one of the, 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 the unfortunate things of racism is that it separates of us. It separates us, especially in those days. And it separated the Latino community and the black community in many ways. But in many ways, the music triumphed and brought us together, especially Machito and the Afro-Cubans. In 1939, at the, an old Jewish catering hall, the Park Palace Ballroom on 110th Street and 5th Avenue, under Mario Balzan's musical direction, they fused jazz arranging technique and the virtuosity of the jazz solos with pure Afro-Cuban rhythm. So we get the first form of Afro-Cuban, I'm sorry, Latin jazz in New York, Afro-Cuban jazz being born in New York. Not in Cuba, but in New York. So that's the beginning, 1939, as far as the, the what we call Latin jazz. Today, all of the countries of Latin America 
are contributing uh, fusions of jazz with their native rhythms. You got people experimenting with tango and jazz in Argentina, cumbia and jazz in Colombia, native Puerto Rican rhythms on the island, bomba en plena with jazz. So it, it's the music of, the, of now and the future. And if jazz represents America, then Latin jazz represents all of the Americas. And really, it represents all of us because it has Amerindian elements, it has African elements, obviously, and European elements in terms of harmony, melody, and lyricism. So um, it shows us that we have many more things in common uh, than differences. And we should be proud of all of that stuff. So, I mean, my mother on my father's side was black, so I would, uh, you know, I would be uh, considered one-sixth black. And by the laws, of the beyond miscegenation laws in New Orleans, I'd have to go up in the, into the, to the balcony. I wouldn't be able to, you know, sit downstairs. So I go, you know, racism, the, 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 the ugly thing about racism, besides taking away your human dignity, is that it, it keeps us apart instead of together. And I, I was very fortunate because I always saw the connections that we had in the music uh, with Africa through people like Mongo Santa Maria, Tito Puente, who exuded the Africanness, the African roots of the of the music. And uh, it's, the roots of the music aren't just Yoruba, like many people think. We have Bantu Congolese roots, roots in a fake culture, and other cultures. So. It's a it's a beautiful thing, man, and and when you see a good salsa orchestra and people are on the floor and it becomes like a spiritual experience, they're they're like possessed. Well, it's just like being in a good gospel church on Sundays, when when the spirit takes takes you over, you know you're feeling the spirit, the Holy Ghost. You're feeling it on the dance floor too in a salsa club. So and. Your parents and your grandparents probably felt that at the Savoy Ballroom when they would listen to Duke or Chick Webb and all these great bands. So we need to get that back and exude that more. People ask me, what's your approach to jazz? Especially to the, the fusions that you do, especially from the Latin side. I go, well, I, uh, I exude the jazz side of things, but I want the band to swing as hard as a dance orchestra. And that's where I'm always coming from, no matter how way out uh, the music gets. So when I, I tell people, when you come to see us perform, uh, you're gonna be moved spiritually, culturally, uh, you're gonna be taken to another place, uh, and you're gonna be possessed by the music. And you know, at the end of it, you're gonna be uh, uh, coming up feeling good. And you're gonna realize that everybody sitting around you is related to you in one way or another. That'll do it again for another dish of the Pace Report. Reporting live here at Jenny's Supper Club here in Harlem, New York. I'd like to personally thank the legendary Bobby Sanabria for his time, as well as Candido Camaro, as well as G&J Productions, who put on this fantastic presentation this evening here at Jenny's Supper Club. Also, the staff and management here at Jenny's Supper Club here in Harlem, New York. As always, please visit my website, www.thepacereport.com, for my weekly column as well as my past segments. Till next time, remember if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Till next time, peace.